We talked a lot here about civil military relations, the health of our democracy. Any any thoughts you want to share on that theme, Elliot? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think it's a massive issue in the United States and a very much underreported and one that is uh, that is not in the forefront of Americans' consciousness the, the way that at least I, I think it necessarily should be. You know, there was, and, and maybe you all are aware of this, um, you know, there's a very interesting video that became kind of a cause celeb for a couple of weeks, uh, which was the case of uh, Marine Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller who right after the Afghanistan withdrawal and the bombing at the Abbey Gate went on Facebook Live and basically in a kind of four minute, you know, tour de force demanded accountability up and down the chain of command from the Secretary of Defense to the Joint Chiefs to the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And it really, um, in this rant sort of ended his career. Uh, and I remember watching that video and I was sort of asking myself, like, like, what am I watching here? You know, is this a rant? Like, what, what is this guy doing? And I sort of sat with me for a while. And the, the word I kind of settled on describing is like this. And um, he's self-immolating. Like he basically did the equivalent of dousing himself in gasoline and lighting himself on fire, professionally speaking. And he was, you know, fired from the Marine Corps, um, lost, his, lost his retirement after 18 years. Um, and I only bring that up because, you know, there is, and this kind of maybe gets to, to Ned's point. I mean, you know, why is the U.S. military popular? You know, why does it consistently rank as one of America's most popular institutions and one that is trusted? And I would offer at least one of the contributing factors is it is one of the very few, if not the last, political institutions of the United States that does not seem to have an overt political bias. It seems somewhat politically neutral, although there have been, I think, in the last few years, forces very much trying to politicize the U.S. military. So it doesn't really possess that bias yet, which is not to say that people within the ranks do not have their political biases and oftentimes heavily one way or another. But there is this, you know, this this culture or this code of omerta that, you know, you don't speak your political beliefs if you are wearing the uniform. Um, and for instance, I remember at one point, and this has always existed, but you know, 20 years ago, uh, during the 2000 elections, I was a college student, and I asked a, a Marine Colonel who was a fellow on campus, you know, whether he voted, and he kind of said to me, "Oh no, I don't vote." Like someone might say, you know, I don't smoke, and I realized that his view was that as a military officer, he should have no say in in who the commander in chief is, because that's not his president; that's actually, you know, the highest level of his chain of command, and he doesn't vote on his chain of command which is just to say that the U.S. military has a very different relationship with political power in the United States. For the U.S. military, it's a matter of that chain of command. And as American politics gets more and more dysfunctional, I think we're going to potentially see more scenarios like the summer of 2020 or January of 2021, where there are massive stressors that are going on and the military becomes a real live wire and chip that is getting played one way or another. I'm not saying this is a partisan. I'm just saying it as, you know, thinking out to the future. And, you know, I think we should be worried that what happens when, you know, another Lieutenant Colonel, maybe not a Stuart Scheller is in a situation, whether that's in Lafayette, Lafayette Park or in uh, around the Capitol in January and, and is told to do something and maybe he or she doesn't agree with that and goes their own way. Uh, and, and I think that is, is something we should be thinking about as a country, particularly in an environment where we have a massive civil military divide. I think it's absolutely accurate to say many people in, in the military, particularly as the military becomes increasingly uh, intergenerational, increasingly recruited from certain portions of the United States, um, and that divide widens and widens, then, you know, could you see uh, a crisis where people in the military are sort of asked to choose politically? And, um, you know, I don't say that to be alarmist, but I think, you know, we are going now in the United States, you know, from contested election to contested election, meaning that, you know, when the election happens, both sides don't just shake hands and say it's over. And each time we see these contested elections, I would say it's sort of the equivalent of, you know, drunk driving in so much as, you know, we've made it through 2016. Now we've made it through 2020. Now we're going to go into 2024. And yes, we've survived all of these, but like the drunk driver, you know, typically the first time the drunk driver wraps his or her car around a telephone pole, it's not the first time they went to the bar and had too many drinks. Maybe it's the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time. And I think we should be very worried about the potential role um, that a large standing military 
has in this country, particularly where there's a massive civil military cultural divide. Because if we look back through history, um, from Caesar's Rome to Napoleon's France, like that does not end well for democracy. Mm -hmm.